Hey guys, this week, how to make a sh sh shoot. I can't say that word on YouTube. I screwed up. People always ask how to make money living on a boat, and there are some great ways, but one in particular has stood the test of time. There are companies out there that will pay you just for knowing sh stuff. So today, two things. First, the money thing, and then we're gonna round this video out by covering some boat vocabulary like head and poop deck, what it means and where it came from. And this is pretty serious stuff. You can tell by way of my shirt having a collar and I'm wearing cologne. It's weird. How to make money while living on a boat is a huge subject and it covers everything from doing YouTube videos, which admittedly isn't for everybody, or using your existing skills like mechanical or technical if you can weld or work on diesel engines, but actually physically working in other countries that you might sail to could lead to some problems without a visa or something and that country is going to want to charge you tax. and. While we don't want to get into trouble, this whole subject rightly deserves its own video, but there's one way people have been funding their sailing adventure since the early days. Think Lynn and Larry Party. Think of the heroes that came before us and lived on their boats and traveled the world. And the way they did it still works. I have an opportunity for you and I have a pretty big announcement, some big changes in my life and I won't be working alone anymore. And while this channel will still be my weekly effort to get more people sailing more easily, I need to find some writers for the big new thing, several of them. We're looking for people who want to make money writing sailing articles regularly. Do you live on a boat and want to make money? Are you an expert in engines or ship systems, electronics, sails, water makers, rigging, are you a yacht broker or maybe a marine tech or an insurance agent or even better, a surveyor? If you have expertise and the ability to write, we'd love to hear from you. This can be an article a month or an article a week. As long as you have the expertise, the ability to research a given subject and write on it and make a point, and you should have some personality and hopefully some experience in the sailing world. Writing on sailing has been a money maker from day one because there are a lot of people, I don't have to tell you, that want to get out there and sail that could benefit from your experience, your tales of woe, your expertise in whatever you happen to be an expert in. And you can literally do it from anywhere in the world now that we have Starlink, and you can do it while living on your boat. In fact, even better, if you are. To find out more, go to ladykaysailing.com forward slash writers. Now let's get to the words. Port and starboard. Port is the left of the ship, and by deductive reasoning, starboard is the right of the ship when you're facing the bow. So unlike left and right, port and starboard refer to fixed locations on a boat. For example, if you're standing on a boat and you spin around backward, your left and your right sides change. But the port side of the boat and the starboard side of the boat stay the same because they're parts of the boat, not a direction per se. In the early days of boating, before the ship's rudders were on the center line of the boat, boats were controlled and steered using an oar. Most sailors are right-handed, so the steering oar was placed over or through the right side of the boat. Combining the old English words steer, meaning steer, and board, meaning side of the boat, we got the word starboard, and it soon started to be used to refer to the steering side of the boat, or the right side, because that's the side they stuck the oar out. As boats and their steering oars grew in size, it became much easier to tether to the dock using the opposite side of the boat, not the side the oar was sticking out that you used for steering. So the left side of the boat became known as larboard or the loading side. But because that was easily confused with the word starboard, it was replaced with port. Since when docked, this is the side of the boat that faces the port. 
the place you're tied up. Showing one's true colors is a phrase that we still use today, but originally it meant hoisting a flag on your boat to declare the ship's origin. It was pretty commonplace to do that. But not all captains told the truth. Think pirates. They would fly false flags to often trick their enemies. The term has become familiar with non-sailors now, showing your true colors, meaning revealing falsehood or untrue nature. Scuttlebutt. This actually still gets used today. It's getting more rare. In the 1800s, though, the fresh drinking water was in a barrel on the boat, and the barrel was called scuttlebutt. Like in offices where the water cooler is a gathering place to chat and gossip with each other, the scuttlebutt was information central, same as on a ship. But in the 1900s, the term scuttlebutt became a synonym for just information. There's whole magazines called scuttlebutt. Loose cannon. I've been called this a few times. When a cannonball stored on a ship jumped out of its storage slot and rolled across the deck, usually wildly depending on the seas, it created a very dangerous situation for the sailors, especially the sailors who were tasked with retrieving it, chasing it around the deck like a wild chicken. The phrase has become used often to describe a person who's unpredictable, most often in some sort of perilous kind of way. Feeling blue. I didn't know this. If a ship's officer died at sea, the vessel would raise a blue flag, and they painted a blue stripe on the hull as a sign of mourning. Today, the term is more used in a generalized way to mean that you're feeling sad. Clean bill of health. It's always good to get one of those. This widely used term has its origins in sailing. It was the document issued to a ship showing that the port that it left from when it set sail had no suffering from an epidemic or infection at the time it left. The term head is still used all the time. You hear captains say they're going to the head or where's the head or going to use the head. And they mean a marine toilet. And that started because of the location of the toilet on the earliest sailing ships. For crewmen, those facilities were located at the front of the ship or the head of the ship. The front of the ships had a figurehead usually carved in wooden figure or bust at the bow of the ship. The toilet was located there. Um, and it was set just above the waterline with often slots cut out under it near the floor level to use the wave splashing action to clean the toilet. With the wind blowing usually from the back to the front, as it does on sailing ships of the day, the head of the ship was the best place for every sailor to relieve themselves. So when the crew went potty, they went to the head of the ship and the name stuck. Also, the wind coming from back to front would often blow the smell forward. So if they went to the bathroom at the front of the boat, it got rid of the smell more easily. And toilet paper, they didn't have that yet. It was often a rope that was hung overboard and the end of the rope was allowed to drag and fray in the sea as they sailed. A sailor would hoist the rope up, wipe with the frayed end, and then drop it back in the water to wash off so the next sailor could use it. No wonder they were sick all the time. Poop deck. This is a funny one, and it honestly doesn't get used very much anymore, but we do hear it from time to time, and many people think the poop deck was the location of the head. But no. The name poop deck comes from the French word for the stern, la poupe. The uppermost rear, or stern, where the ship's wheel is located was called the poop deck. The poop deck was elevated so the captain and the pilot, the guy steering, would have a clear view over the front of the ship. Some say that during heavy weather, the winds from the rear of the ship as she sailed along would splash waves and create foam and sea spray, and the tall waves would splash over the poop deck, leaving the pilot or the helmsman quite wet. So after a long day of steering in bad weather, the pilot or helmsman was called pooped. A quick note before we continue. The mission here at Lady K Sailing has always been to get more people sailing more easily. And I couldn't do it without you guys, the help of the Lady K Sailing patrons. These are people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make this all possible. If you'd like to help out, please consider becoming a patron. Toe the line. This is always used behaviorally. And originally, the space between each pair of deck planks on a wooden ship 
was filled with a packing material called oakum and then sealed with a mixture of pitch and tar. The result, from afar looking at the boat, was a series of parallel lines about a half a foot or so apart. Once a week, as a rule, usually on a Sunday, a warship's crew was ordered to fall in at quarters. That is, each group of men into which the crew was divided would line up in formation in a given area of the deck. To ensure that a neat and tidy alignment of each row, the sailors were directed to stand with their toes just touching one of those particular seams. Another use for these seams was punitive. The youngsters in a ship, be they the ship's boy or student officers, might be required to stand with their toes just touching a designated seam for a length of time as punishment for some minor infraction or discipline, such as talking or fidgeting at the wrong time. A tough captain might require the miscreant to stand there not talking to anyone in fair weather or foul weather for hours at a time. Hopefully, he would learn that it was easier and more pleasant to conduct himself in the required manner than suffer the punishment. From these two uses of deck seams comes our cautionary word to the youngsters these days to toe the line. Even keel, I hear this all the time even today, and a vessel that floats upright, balanced without a list, is said to be on an even keel. And this term has come today to mean calm and steady. Um, a keel is like the backbone of a vessel, the lowest in principal centerline structural member running fore and aft. Keeled over, or upside down, was a sailor's term for death. Fathom. We hear this in the movies all the time. Anything with a pirate ship in it, they say fathom. And it's a nautical measurement equal to six feet. It's used to measure the depth of water at sea. Make sure you don't run aground, as we all do. The word was also used to describe taking the measurement or to fathom something. Today, when one's trying to figure something out, they're trying to fathom it or get to the bottom of it. First rate these days implies excellence. From the 16th century on until steam-powered ships took over, British naval ships were rated as to the number of heavy cannon they carried. A ship with 100 or more guns was a first-rate line-of-battle ship. Second-rate ships had 90 to 98 guns. Third-rate, 64 to 89 guns. Fourth-rate, 50 to 60 guns. And frigates carrying 20 to 48 guns were 5th and 6th rated. Hand over fist. That means a lot, I think. Hand over fist was a British term for the act of moving quickly up a rope or hoisting a sail quickly, so it comes from sailing, which was a matter of pride and competition amongst young sailors back then. It is thought that American sailors changed the term from hand over hand to hand over fist, and the term now means to advance or accumulate rapidly. Overbearing. And no, we're not talking about your mother-in-law. To sail downwind directly at another ship, stealing or diverting its wind so that you can sail faster by stealing all their wind. That's overbearing. Skyscrapers uh, usually makes me think of New York. But a skyscraper is a small triangular sail set above the sky sail in order to maximize the effect of the wind in lighter winds. Slush fund. This is another New York word. A slushy surrey of fat that was obtained by boiling or scraping the empty salted meat storage barrels on a ship was called slush. This stuff was often sold ashore by the ship's cook for the benefit of himself or the crew. The money that he derived from selling the slush became known as a slush fund. Son of a gun. When in port with the crew restricted to the ship for any extended period of time, wives and ladies of easy virtue were often allowed to come aboard and live on board along with the crew if they were gonna be there for a long time. And sometimes, not uncommon though, children were born aboard the ship if it was in port for long enough. And a convenient place to give birth was on the gun deck in between the guns. If a child's father was unknown, then they were empty, entered into the ship's log as son of a gun. Turn a blind eye. Now, this today means to sort of ignore something that 
you know, somebody else is doing that they might get in trouble for. But from Admiral Lord Nelson's awesome display and badassery at the Battle of Copenhagen, when the signal at the battle was given to stop fighting, which is probably waving a flag, Nelson held his spyglass to his blind eye. He had a blind eye. He put the spyglass on his blind eye so that he could say that he didn't see the signal to stop the fighting. He then proceeded to continue fighting. Under the weather. Keeping watch on board sailing ships was a boring and tedious job, but the worst watch station was on the weather or windward side up at the front. The sailor who was assigned to keep watch at that station was subject to constant pitching and rolling of the ship, and by the end of his watch he'd be soaked from all the waves crashing over the bow. A sailor who was assigned to this unpleasant duty was said to be under the weather. Sometimes these men actually fell ill and died from a result of that assignment, which is why today, under the weather is used to refer to somebody suffering from an illness. A related theory claims that ill sailors were sent below deck or under the weather if they were feeling sick. Big wigs is like the bosses at work. And strangely enough, this one is a bit of seafaring lingo as well that pretty much means what it says. Senior officers in Britain's Royal Navy at the time actually did wear bodaciously large wigs as the style of the day. And the bigger the wig, the higher up they were. Cup of Joe. The nickname for coffee comes about due to the reforms initiated in 1913 by Josephus Daniels, then Secretary of the U.S. Navy under President Woodrow Wilson. One such reform that he made was the elimination of the officer's wine mess. No more alcohol. A policy received by a lot of people less than enthusiastically. And since that time, a cup of the strongest drink allowed aboard a U.S. naval ship has been referred to a cup of Joe. Because of the Joe guy that took away the wine. Hunky-dory is kind of a cute way of saying everything's okay, but Commodore Matthew Perry's historic visit to Japan in July of 1853 began an era of openness and commercial intercourse between the East and the West. Yokohama, Japan was one of Japan's busiest ports at the time, and the main street on the waterfront district of Yokohama is Hunky-dory. It became famous for its ability to provide an abundance of pleasures to sailors while they were in port. And while Hunky Dory was relatively straightforward to navigate and hard to get lost on that street, the winding side streets and back roads around it were not only confusing but potentially dangerous to unwary sailors, particularly those of the inebriated persuasion who often fell victim to robbery or worse. Advice was, if you stayed on Hunky Dory Street, you could probably find everything you need in relative safety, hence the street name association with everything being okay. Posh means bougie or rich or fancy, but in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we witnessed the birth of the golden age of travel around the world. Huge, opulent luxury liners began crossing the globe, all constructed to, provi to provide the wealthy of the day with a means of traveling about in style. The meals were equal to the world's finest hotels, orchestras, played for people to dance, a small army of stewards to wait on the passengers hand and foot, and one perk available for those willing to shell out even more money was found aboard the P&O Steamship Line, a major shipping company of the day serving China and India. Well-heeled travelers always requested cooler cabins not to be in the sun, they don't want to be sweating all night, so they'd be located on the shady side of the ship while crossing the Indian Ocean. Cabins that P&O charged a premium for, in addition to the already substantial fare. Now, when they left port, as port was on the shady side of the outbound leg, and starboard was on the shady side when they were on their way back, passengers who requested to change cabins to the shady side of the boat on the way back were port outward, starboard homeward. That's what was printed on their tickets. Posh. 
Touch and go, often used to describe a tricky or delicate situation. This phrase refers to a ship touching bottom with her keel, but still being able to continue forward without grounding solidly. It especially highlights those suspenseful few seconds all boat owners experience at some point, that period of alternating curses and prayers between touching the bottom and then reaching the safety of deeper water. I hope you enjoyed learning with me, and if you have any cool boat words that you'd like to share the meaning of, or any funny boat words, please leave them in the comments below. I can't wait to hear from you. Until next week, friends, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. We'll see you guys. Love you.